Hello, I'm Richard Hollingham, and this time in the Planet Earth podcast, it's the birds and the bees. I'm on a farm in rural Berkshire to look for some bees. Amazing birds later, and we'll also be heading to the Amazon rainforest to investigate the hidden world of microbes. We have estimated that the, each the single tree species have approximately 500 or 600 different uh, bacterial species living on the leaf surface. Just on the leaf surface? That's right. And then when you go down to the bark? Oh, then you have another maybe 200, 300. I'm on the Farley Farms estate, just a few miles south of Reading, amongst a patchwork of fields, woodland and rolling hills. And I'm standing on a grassy strip of land beside a vast field of white flowers. This is a linseed crop. And with me is Robin Blake from the University of Reading. Now, Robin, your research has looked at ways of cutting the decline in Britain's bumblebees. But what's the problem? Agricultural intensification and increased uh, habitat loss and fragmentation has led to a decline in the number of sort of pollen and nectar foraging habitats for bumblebees. And why does that matter? Well that matters because bumblebees and of course other pollinators are very important in the pollination of our food crops and also our wildflowers. I suppose a lot of people have heard about the decline in honeybees and we care about honeybees. Do, Do you think bumblebees get sort of forgotten? I think they probably do to some extent. I think you're right, you know, there's been an awful lot of press coverage about the decline of the honeybee and, and the associated losses for that. Um, but in actual fact, the, bunny, the bumblebee is responsible for the pollination of probably quite a few more crops and is, is far more important than I think a lot of people think. So we should worry and farmers should be concerned too. Yeah, absolutely. Now, your research looked at how farmers could help reverse this decline and... The area I described, this grassy strip alongside the field, this is where your experiment is. Yeah. Just describe what's going on here. I think people will be familiar with the idea of sort of grassy strips around fields. It's quite common now. Well, the grassy strips have been are really common under various agri-environment options. Um, and while they offer some biodiversity benefits, for example, for ground-nesting birds or predatory invertebrates such as spiders and beetles, because there aren't any... Uh, wild flowers present there's nothing there to attract insect pollinators so what did you do then so our project is looking at like two different management treatments so we're adding wild flowers and we're also applying a graminicide so that's a grass herbicide it has the aim of suppressing the grasses and really giving the wildflowers a chance of becoming established in the strips and let's look then at, at this strip here we've got wildflowers in front of us rather obvious wildflowers you'll have to identify these for me okay what have we got here um so we've got oxide daisy here which is in flower uh this is knapweed um we've got yarrow ladies bed straw uh ribwort plantain there's uh bird's foot trefoil here the yellow flower so a really lovely array i mean just yeah. from the complete layman's point of view there's some very pretty yellow and white and and, and blue flowers here and yet further down this strip it's just grass yeah, and that's, and that's representative of you know, many of the grass margins in the UK. So you've got the wild flowers. Have you got the bumblebees? Yeah, we have. And in the plots that have received the wildflowers and the graminicide, we can see a 25-fold increase in bumblebee numbers compared to the existing grass strips. So even just these, these relatively small areas, you're getting more bumblebees? Yeah, absolutely, and we're seeing you know, significantly higher numbers, and not just of bumblebees, but of solitary bees, honeybees, butterflies as well. So this proves it works? It does, yes. OK, well, let's talk to a farmer then, Mark Robbins, who runs the estate here. Great, isn't it? It looks absolutely fabulous, and uh, I'm very proud to have them on our stewardship margins, really. I mean, we, we put these margins down in 2003, and the mixtures that we were asked to put down by Natural England, the prescription we put down, uh, are prescriptions that I put down when I was farming back in 1996, and they are just grass. And they, I've al- I always had a view that they were environmentally very dull, um, so when Robin came along and said he'd like to try something out, I, I grasped the opportunity because uh, you know I wanted to see whether we were proven right or not, and it appears that we have been. 
There is a, a difference, though, and a difference in effort, a difference in, in money involved in this. If you just left this strip, you would end up with grass, but you have to actively spray it with something to suppress the grass if you want the nice wild flowers. I think, I think you're absolutely right on one level, but what you've got to remember is before these strips were put in in 2003, there was a crop right up to the hedge, so we had to actively plant the grass and we had to actively keep the docks and the nettles and the thistles out so on one level yes you're right but on another level if you're going to plant a new stewardship strip around the edge of a field you might as well plant it with something that's going to provide some sort of benefit which is what we appear to have seen here and is that something you're prepared to pay for is that something that needs to be paid for by i suppose the taxpayer to support wildlife, to support bumblebees around fields? I think if we set the whole thing in context, back in 2003 when when Farley took the decision when I arrived to put these stewardship strips in, you had crops of wheat that were worth 70, 60, 70 pounds a tonne and the outer six metres of any field, the headland strip around a field, is never going to produce you barn-filling crops of wheat. So that on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got the environmental payment that we receive for this stewardship margin, which more than compensates for the loss of that wheat crop what's happened in the last 18 months of course is that wheat is now not 70 quid a tonne it's now 200 pounds a tonne and that presents a dilemma but if I look at it over the 10 year period of the scheme you know uh, two years at 200 pounds again tonne against eight years at 70 pounds a tonne the mathematics are very straightforward it does rely on a subsidy but where I was coming from in putting these things in is that if we can provide some sort of environmental benefit for that subsidy then one feels that one's doing one's bit where we are now with these sorts of mixtures and, and, and margins actually you are providing a real benefit and not just grass strips that don't really do a great deal and have you noticed I mean not just that the wildflowers here this beautiful array of quite quite high wildflowers here have you also noticed bees coming back uh, very much so I mean you just whilst you were in interviewing Robin just then if you look if you look at the detail of it you can actually see activity there if we were to go and stand up on the rest of the the grass strip I'm pretty sure you wouldn't see a great deal so it is there to be seen there's no doubt at all about that and I mean going back to the pollinators and things we've got the spring linseed that's now come out into flower here what better example of the fact that we need as agriculture as 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 consumers of food we need these pollinators to make sure that the crops in the field are pollinated Um, and and here we are we've got a crop of linseed on the one side and we've got insect activity encouraging the the, the bumblebees and the, and 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 the, and the nectar bees into this strip so it, it seems to work robin this is a, a great example it strikes me of of science this side of me applied to the real world which is the crop growing on the on the right of me yeah absolutely and i think it's just important uh, to see how these habitats in the margins can be used to help the crops, you know, because obviously bees are important in the pollination of crops such as linseed. This is the research. Where do you go from here? Because you need other farmers on board, really. Yeah, I mean, the research that I've done, I've, I've focused just on four farms in southern England, and whilst we've replicated those results across those four farms, uh, if I'm going to make the policymakers listen, then I think we need more data on... Uh, you know, a range of farms across the UK. But more importantly, we need to get the farmers to do the treatments for themselves and really show that, the, you know, the benefits can work. Robin and Mark, thank you both. And you can see pictures of the farm on our Facebook page, where you can also see some stunning images from the Arctic and Antarctic featured in our recent audio diaries. To read more about Robin's research, check out the story on Planet Earth Online. Just search for Planet Earth Online. And this is the Planet Earth podcast with news from the natural world. And no disrespect to Berkshire, but we're going to head somewhere a little more exotic now. The number and variety of microscopic organisms occupying every corner of the planet, from the highest mountains to the deepest oceans, defies the imagination. There are reckoned to be a billion times more microbes in the oceans than stars in the known universe. Until recently, the nature and function of these organisms were pretty much a mystery, but that's changed with the development of ever more powerful tools for DNA sequencing. A new global initiative called the Earth Microbiome Project is aiming to build up a genetic picture of this invisible layer of our ecosystems and, most importantly, investigate what it's all for. Tim Hirsch has been talking to some of the scientists involved and starts his report in the Brazilian rainforest. 
The Atlantic forest of Brazil is among the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Here, for example, you can find almost a thousand species of birds, and more than 400 tree species have been found in a single hectare. Thanks to DNA sequencing, researchers like Marcio Lambais are now able to uncover a whole new dimension to that biodiversity. What we found here is uh, that every single tree species it has its own bacterial community. Uh, that lives on the leaves and then uh, also we found the same thing for the bacteria living on the bark and associate with the roots. We have estimated that the, each the single tree species have approximately 500 or 600 different uh, bacterial species living on the leaf surface. Just on the leaf surface? That's right. And then when you go down to the bark? Oh, then you have another maybe 200, 300 and if you go down to the roots we have uh, something around 1000. So or even more than that. And are you saying, is your research suggesting, that each of those bacteria species are particular to that species of tree? Probably. The overlap between plant species are very small, based on our estimates. We have only maybe 3% of the whole uh, bacterial species that are common to different plants. Most of them are particular and specific for a single plant species. What we have here is a representative sample of the UK's soils in three boxes, really. I've swapped the heat of the rainforest for a freezer in the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Oxfordshire, where Rob Griffiths is using similar techniques to look at the diversity of microbes in British soils. Sample has got a barcode on it, so we can, you know, we've got sort of good tracking from exactly where the sample was taken in the field. All the sort of information is held in a database. So for each soil sample we have, there are information uh, that was collected as part of the countryside survey on uh, the kinds of plants that were there, uh, climate, uh, GPS location. Okay, well, it's getting a little bit cold in here, so why don't we just uh, shut up those boxes and continue our conversation outside before we all freeze to death. Here we are in the laboratory. So now we have very small tubes in the freezer where we've weighed out the soil into these small little tubes. And then what we want to do is basically we use some chemical methods and uh, physical disru disruption. We put these tubes in a beating apparatus. Which so to just, to, just to, to describe it for the listeners, this is a, a small tube uh, about, what, three centimetres long or so and a tiny little bit of soil in there. A little soil in there. Uh, 0.25 grams and some beads. Now, basically, we, what we want to do now is extract the DNA. So all the DNA that's in that soil, we want to pull out. So, so when soil. you say you're, you're, you're extracting the DNA, that means you're not looking at sort of individual organisms. No, you're looking at the, the total DNA of what's inside yeah, there, is that right? Unfortunately, um, we don't actually ever really get to see any organisms, but we do know that even a cell that looks identical to another cell could have a completely different genetic makeup. So um, the only real way... Unfortunately, that you can look at the ecology of these organisms is to look at their DNA sequences. Next question, which is the difficult one, is why does it matter? I mean, you know, the more we know about this stuff, how potentially might it help us in the future? Well, I mean, this is the, the fundamental question. Once, once we know where we find different types of microorganisms, then we can start doing, you know, the really fun science, which is looking at, well, does it matter if we find a different diversity in one soil compared to another soil? Hopefully that's going to start to tell us whether communities, for example, across, across the country, we know that they differ from a sort of taxonomic perspective, but are they, are they functionally different? And uh, how, how is, for example, the things that man does affecting the uh, functional capacity of uh, the microbes in soil? And so it, it could help, for example, to understand the human impacts on exactly. the environment yeah exactly so it's human impacts on the environment are, are, is the way we manage the land affecting microbial diversity is that going to have any further consequences in terms of uh, for example uh, you know greenhouse gas cycling which microbes in soil are very important regulators of the samples from the countryside survey will form part of an ambitious project to build up a global picture of microbiodiversity, a kind of microbe atlas of the world. The Earth Microbiome Project is being coordinated by Jack Gilbert at Chicago's Argonne Laboratory. We need to understand how the microbes in the ecosystem control ecosystem health. Hence, the Earth Microbiome Project wants to investigate microbes around the world, 
and relate them, not in a, not in a survey way, not, we're not trying to understand what types of organisms are there, we're trying to understand what they're doing in each ecosystem and how that is affecting the way that ecosystem functions and the services it provides. Jack Gilbert previously worked at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory to analyse microbes in the English Channel. His team found that there was a marked seasonal cycle so that a much greater variety of bacteria was found in the winter than in the summer. Professor Dawn Field, also from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, collaborated in the research. There's been a lot of debate for a long time uh, in ecology in general and especially in microbial ecology about whether microbes are everywhere so that you have the same stock of microbes in every place basically on Earth but that the environment selects out only a few to be very, very abundant or if we really do find completely different communities in different locations. And some further work that we've done there actually suggests that in many ways the same community is there. It's simply a shift in the proportion. So at different times of years, certain uh, microbial lineages do much better and start to bloom up, so to speak. So, you're, so it's more you're just detecting them at particular uh, times of year, but it's not. But they're always there. Exactly, mm. exactly. Which is um, very interesting in terms of microbial theory, and it would have a lot of implications in the future. For example, it would mean if, for example, you wanted to do remediation, um, for example, in terms of the oil spill. It was more effective to put nutrients on that oil spill and pull out of that background the kinds of microbes that could eat oil than it was to introduce new microbes. We're never really going to get to the bottom of, of this, are we? Isn't it just too huge to think about? Right, I think you're right. And I think this harks back to that many people have been sort of overwhelmed by what could be there. And yet I think um, those sort of core to the Earth Microbiome Project believe that we're going to find signals if we're very clever in the way that we sample, that we either sample the same location over time or we use experiments to try to tell how different um, conditions, for example, temperature or nutrients, change the microbes, and that we work together very closely to pool our respective data sets and rationalize the experiments that we're going to do as a global community because we only have one Earth and we want to understand the whole system, that we will be able to make some traction in this area. But it is a huge undertaking. Many people now are likening it to landing on the moon, that it is a truly grand challenge for humanity. Dawn Field from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology with Tim Hirsch reporting. If you've been following the news on Planet Earth Online, you'll have seen quite a few stories recently about the wonders of birds. It turns out they can fly further, higher and faster than ever thought possible, even perhaps than the aircraft that's buzzing away in the background. Well, Tamara Jones has written those stories and she's with me. Let's start with the furthest. Well, the furthest is the Arctic Tern. Now, the Arctic Tern... It makes the, the furthest migration of any creature on the planet, which is pretty, pretty impressive, because it migrates from the Arctic down to the Antarctic and back again. Before this latest study, researchers thought that it travelled about 40,000 kilometres, which is a, a, you know, it's a long, long way. But in this study, some researchers from British Antarctic Survey, from Greenland, from Denmark and Iceland, decided to tag some of these or, or track some of these birds with uh, these tags called geolocators. These geolocators tell researchers exactly where the birds have been. And by doing this, they found that the birds actually fly twice that distance. They do this, they sort of cover the same, you know, they make, they're making the same route, their trip. They go from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back in. But because the, the route is so circuitous, they actually travel 80,000 kilometres every single year. So they're going from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again, but they're doing it in, in twice the distance. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, what, what happens is you've got two different, two different groups. One follows the coast of Africa and one follows the coast of South America. But when they go back up, up the Atlantic, they don't just take a direct route from the Antarctic to the Arctic. They sort of do a bit of a figure of eight almost, or half a figure of eight, um, which really, that's what sort of doubles the distance. OK, the highest flying next yeah this is another impressive creature the bar-headed goose and yes it holds the record for the highest flying bird and the reason for that is because it travels from india right up to mongolia places in china of course if you think about where those different countries are that means that the bird has to cross the himalayas which is the, the the you know the highest mountain range on earth what the researchers found using um, satellite trackers is that they travel from India to the height of Mount Everest, which is nearly 9,000 metres, in just eight hours, all in one go. OK, so we've had the furthest, we've had the highest, 
Now the fastest. Yep, the fastest. It's the Great Snipe. Now the Great Snipe, well, you could say it's the fastest over long distances because, of course, probably you've, you've heard of the Kestrel, which when it's diving to get its prey, it can reach speeds of 200 kilometres an hour, which isn't really, really quick. Now the Great Snipe doesn't fly at that speed, but what it can do is it can fly nearly 7,000 kilometres at nearly 100 kilometres an hour. That's just over 4,000 miles at 60 miles an hour. All in one go. It doesn't stop, which is really mad. <laughs> it's a lot better than my car. Thanks, Tamara. All the details on Planet Earth online. And that is the Planet Earth podcast. I'm Richard Hollingham from the farm here in rural Berkshire. Thanks for listening.